If you want to really understand who your dream customers are and where they are congregating online, you need to be able to enter the conversation that's already taking place inside of their mind and see the world the way that they see it. Storytelling is what connects us as humans. It's also the earliest form of communication. Sell what you are without diminishing or referencing others. For you to be smart does not require me to be stupid. This is the Storytelling for Sales podcast, a show about leveraging the power of storytelling to ignite your sales performance and grow your business. Well, hello and welcome back. I'm your host, executive sales coach Ed Bilat, and it is great to be back with you again. I am so excited about today's show because our guest is a true master at seeing opportunity where nobody expected to find any. Not only does he has the ability to spot amazing opportunities, everything he touches really turn to gold. Listen to this. In just six years, he was able to build a $20 billion company from nothing, from old Hershey chocolate factory in Smith Falls, Ontario, Canada, with 4,000 employees in 16 countries. We have a guest who needs no introduction. Mr. Bruce Linton, the amazing founder and the man behind Martello Technologies, Tweed, the Canopy Growth Corporation, and most recently, Rockify. Without further ado, Bruce Linton, a huge welcome to you, and thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am so excited to have you with us today. Maddie Pimentel is joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina. She is currently National Sales Training Manager for Snap AV, and she has an extensive experience and results in sales strategy, sales management, and training. And what is specifically interesting about her is that she has not just been a trainer or professional facilitator all her life. She has actually been on the sales floor herself as an account executive and area sales manager, and she knows exactly what it feels like when sales are not happening and uh, you're going from hero to zero, beginning of every month. Mary is fluent in Spanish. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and moved to Atlanta with her family when she was two months old. Mary Pimentel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. If you are using the internet, it's almost impossible to ignore this guy. I am so excited that the folks at his company, ClickFunnels, have reached out to us. And yes, we are featuring Mr. Russell Brunson. As you probably know, over the last 15 years, Russell has built a following of over a million entrepreneurs, sold hundreds of thousands of copies of his books, and co-founded a software company called ClickFunnels. Get this, they have launched in October 2014 and the company grew to 100 million in the first three years. Russell Brunson, welcome to the show. What business success stories inspires you and why? So I do like when people try something that everyone thinks is not a good idea or not possible. And so I'm very impressed with Elon and Tesla and the heavy lift capabilities and Hyperloops. Like, you know, these are... um, outrageous ideas, which at least in two of the three is already turned into evidence of a great business that disrupts so many things. That isn't like adding a feature to a business. It's creating a sector. So something absolutely new. Yeah. Something which did not exist before. And where all your customers are already someone else's customer. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Oh, wow. When I saw your questions and we talked about this, I immediately knew who inspires me and their success story in business is something that guides me every day. And so Uh this story is about my father. My father, his name is Roberto Saba. My mom and dad left communist Cuba at the ages of 22 and 27 to make a better life for themselves and our family here in the United States in 1968. Wow. Very yes. young. Huh? <laughs> yes. Right. And so they left everything they knew because they knew they wanted freedom. They knew they wanted the ability to make their own way. And so even though my father had an accounting degree from the University of Havana, he worked any jobs he could get until 1970 when he actually opened his own business. So it only took him two years to gather the resources and get everything together to open his own business. Wow. What kind of business? 
Yes, yes. Well, he was the general manager for a union oil service station, which included gasoline and auto repairs. And of course, my mom helped him in the business. And throughout the years, my dad and my mom's business won numerous awards. And in 1991, the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce awarded my father's business Business of the Year for all of Atlanta. Yeah. Wow. So, yes, a lot to be proud of. So many entrepreneurs found temporary success because they figured out one way to get traffic or they mastered one tactic. For example, Google Ads or SEO. But then in one quick slap, they lost everything. I started thinking about why I've been able to not just survive during each of the slaps, but actually thrive. The more I thought about why we've done so well, despite the constant changes, the more I realized I didn't learn traffic the way that most other entrepreneurs learn traffic. Normally, most people learn how to get traffic in the following manner. A new website will become popular and quickly grow to a big user base where entrepreneurs will see an opportunity where they can buy or earn traffic on this new platform. For example, Twitter or Facebook. A group of early adopters start using it and they figure out the tricks to leverage the platform to get traffic. For the next few months or years, they use these concepts to mine out tons of traffic at very low costs. Eventually, more people find out about it and start using these channels. With more demand for this new traffic, the supply goes down and the platform starts charging more money for each click. So how did you even get into the sales world? Wow, I started early. It's kind of funny because when I was in about fifth grade, each year my dad had a big celebration for their anniversary and they had balloons, snow cones, but I knew I wanted to work the hot dog stand. (laughs) So, (laughs) and so even though everything was free to the customers, it really taught me about asking questions just to make sure I got their order right. Plus I would suggest drinks or chips if they didn't ask for it. So I knew from that time it was about making the customer happy happy. (laughs) I don't find it very relaxing that I got to wait for someone to say what we should work on or that maybe they can uh, decide that I don't get a raise or I get fired. Now, obviously, I can still get fired by a board as I've recently proven, but I don't want to have that exposure and it makes me uncomfortable. Second part is I'm not a particularly specifically great person at one task, so I'm not going to get a job as a coder or designer or necessarily as a somebody you would put in your analytics or marketing department. So the effect of it is I'm, I'm a very enthusiastic generalist. And the result of being a very enthusiastic generalist is that you're able to start certain types of businesses. So I wouldn't be able to start, say, a business that necessarily, unless I knew what problem there was for the next design of a specific type of chip. But I might need a chip to solve a problem that I have in another business. And so that's really kind of how I got here. And um I just find it more relaxing to be responsible for making payroll rather than waiting to be paid. On September 23rd, 2014, Todd Dickerson, Dylan Jones, and I launched a new software company that we naively believed would change the world. The goal was to create a product that would free all entrepreneurs and give them the ability to get their messages out to the market faster and easier than ever before so they could change the lives of the customers that they were called to serve. The company we launched was called ClickFunnels. A few short months after we launched ClickFunnels, I released a book that I had been working on for almost a decade. I was a first-time author, and because my book was about sales funnels, something that was extremely exciting to me, but pretty boring to most others, I was nervous about how people would respond to it. That book was called Dotcom Secrets, and little did I know that that book would become the playbook for how people build sales funnels online, and was the key to the initial growth of our company. When people understood how they could use funnels to grow their companies, well, they started to use funnels to grow their companies. A few of the core concepts that I first revealed in Dotcom Secrets were the secret of the value ladder and how you can use it to provide more value to your customers and make more money from every customer in the process. How to attract your dream customers that you want to work with and repel the types of customers that you don't want to work with so you only spend time serving the people that you enjoy being around. The exact funnels and sales scripts you can use to convert website and funnel visitors into customers and move them through your value ladder so you can serve them at your highest level and a whole bunch more. As Garrett J. White told me after reading the book and applying it to his company, I already had the fire, but you gave me the framework I needed to grow. Over the next two years, that book became the underground playbook used by over 100,000 marketers to build their sales funnels online. But as ClickFunnels grew, I started to see a big division between those who were making money with their funnels and those who made funnels but weren't making any money. People had mastered the funnel structures and frameworks because of dot-com secrets, and they could quickly build those funnels inside of ClickFunnels, but some people weren't making any money because they lacked the basic understanding of how to convert their funnel visitors into customers. They didn't understand the fundamentals of persuasion, storytelling, building a tribe, becoming a leader, and communicating with the people who entered into their funnels. And so I began my second book with the goal of helping readers to learn and master the persuasion secrets that are necessary to convert people at each stage of their funnel. 
What would you say would be the top three critical skills you think salespeople should have and actually must have in order to thrive today because it changed so much? Oh, absolutely. It's ever changing. But I think one thing remains the same, and that is it's all about the relationship. It's always all about the relationship. That's the number one thing. And I would say that the second thing is because it's about and only about the relationship, listening is a lot more important than speaking. And your customer is only going to truly listen to you when you're speaking to their needs. So Mm -hmm. I would say that the needs assessment or the discovery step of the sales process is absolutely the most important thing. And that's from personal experience as being a sales rep on the floor, as a manager, as a training manager, leading training and development, all of that. It's always about understanding the customer and being able to have that most important step be the one you spend the most time on is really understanding the customer. And of course, as a trainer, I think the third thing that's critical is learn everything that you can about your products, your processes, everything that relates to the company you represent. So when the time comes, you have really successfully helped this customer and then you can build that relationship. Yeah, I told somebody once, I said, you know, you are much better to get fired because you implemented your idea and it didn't work than to get fired for implementing something that wasn't your idea and it didn't work. At least that was your baby, right? Yeah. Make sure you think about it. Do I want it this way? Do I want it that way? Do I want it? You know, if you consider how you want it to be done and where you want it to go and how you want the culture to be and, you know, all the things that create an environment where people feel they can make things happen, make sure that you're not going completely on a path that you disagree with, but because it's been advised to you. Just because it was given to you. That's an interesting point. So like with regards to growth and, and sales specifically, and of course, on this podcast, we call sales everything right? Raising the money, convincing your board of directors, negotiating with suppliers. It's all sales, right? It's just a dirty word, right? (laughs) No, no, you're selling all the time. You're selling your company so people, the best people join it. So the capital comes to it so that you get licenses. I went so far as to tell people that when you're forming the opinion of a regulator, you're selling. And that means that if you walk in the parking lot, so if the regulator drives on your property, Mm -hmm. you park in the same parking area as all the staff, If they get out of the car and the first thing they see is a bunch of ashtrays, uh, you know, cigarette butts sitting there, did that help us sell them that we're terrific or hurt us in selling them that we're terrific? So I don't want any cigarette butts on the ground in the parking lot because that diminishes the successful selling of our image. While dot-com secrets was the science of funnel building, expert secrets became the art behind successful funnels, helping people to move through your funnels and become your dream customers. That brings us to this book, the third and final volume in the trilogy, Traffic Secrets. Traffic is the fuel for every successful business. It is the people who are coming into your funnels. The more people you can get in front of, the bigger impact you and your company can have, which in turn usually creates more money for your company. As we watch members of ClickFunnels growing their companies with funnels, using the structure from Dotcom Secrets and the persuasion skills they learn from Expert Secrets, many people were still struggling because they didn't know how to get consistent traffic or people into their funnels. On the flip side, those who were getting traffic from Facebook or Google were nervous that if either of those sources dried up, they could lose their companies overnight. I think relationship selling is oversold. So maybe I might not buy something from somebody I don't like, but I won't buy something from somebody I like if it's not very valuable and useful. Just because you happen to like them, right? Right. I get along. I've known you for 10 years. Listen, the reason I know you is we're doing business. And so I think people have to quit relying on just the relationship, like the relationship should provide both parties with great value. And so I find that I don't go to somebody who I made money for last round. If I raise $100 million and you put in $20 million, and before you know it, your $20 million is worth $40 million, of course you should feel good about me, but I can't go to you and say, hey, last time I made you $20 million, you need to invest. They should say, get lost. They should say, why? How come this time I'm gonna make even more? How come this time it's a better idea? So I can have the meeting, but this relationship you should buy because we've done things together in the past is nonsense. I never got a penny because people liked us. They gave us first money because it was a good argument, logical. And we had 16 times in a row where we created more value in the company than the amount of money that came in. So if they wanted to, they could sell their stock for more than they paid for it. I think relationships have to have a lot more than some people think they are. You know, you get a phone call from, hey, I... uh, 
I did some legal work for you a couple of years ago. Remember we played in the golf tournament together. Yep. The work was shit. I'm not buying anymore. <laughs> April 27, 2018 was the day that my kids and I looked forward to for a long time. It was the opening night of the movie Avengers Infinity War. I've been a superhero fan ever since the first Iron Man movie came out, but not long enough to know the entire history from the original comic books. So everything that was happening in the movies was a huge surprise to me. This was the 19th movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and all the prior movies had culminated into this epic standoff between Thanos and the Avengers. In the movie, you see Thanos as the ultimate bad guy, but he actually thinks he's doing good. He's concerned that the universe is overpopulated, and he believes that it's his mission to save it. His goal is to gather all the Infinity Stones, put them into his gauntlet like a big glove, and then when he snaps his fingers, restore balance to the universe by killing half of the population. The movie ended, spoiler alert, with a huge cliffhanger after Thanos collected all the Infinity Stones and snapped his fingers. In an instant, half of the people in the universe disappeared. The next day after watching the movie, I was talking to my friend and fellow online marketer, Peng Jun, about the movie, and he said something that sparked an idea. That idea later became an event and since has resulted in me writing this book. Talking about the founder of Facebook, Peng Jun said, Do you ever feel that Mark Zuckerberg is like Thanos? And his whole goal is to wipe out half of the entrepreneurs who are advertising on Facebook? He could literally snap his fingers and half the online entrepreneurs would lose their businesses overnight. We always want to be part of that conversation and we're like, oh, I got something great to add. But we just have to have that patience to sit back and always know it's about the customer. It's not about us. Yeah, like I think I've read the sales story then the beginning of the discovery appointment so sales rep just casually asks a question so and, and how's your dog and the customer <laughs> says, well, well the dog actually died yeah uh, oh, oh that's gosh. great let me take you through the first point of my power presentation <laughs> so, like, oh lord that's yeah. a recipe for disaster that's terrible rapport building what do you mean it's great <laughs> so the dog, oh, the dog died gosh. Right. So like, yeah. very often we just listen with an intent to respond, not with an intent to actually That's right. uh, to understand. Right. That's right. But I mean, isn't it like really difficult to train salespeople? Oh, my goodness. Well, it can be, but it's, it's my passion. So I don't find it to be difficult, but it is it is very much a time staking process to prepare to train the sales reps. OK, so tell me more. This is interesting. Like, What steps do you need? to actually take to understand sales rep and to train them. Absolutely. Well, I have to understand needs of the business. I have to understand the timelines. And then once I understand the solution or the product that we need to launch on a certain date, I will put together the PowerPoint, the presentation, the material surrounding the training of that, including product managers and anyone else that needs to be a part of it. And so once we roll it out, I think it's important not only to train it, but to have that closed loop system to make sure we're delivering the right content at the right time. So I train it or our team will train something and immediately I send out a survey Mm -hmm. and I need to know and understand how valuable the training was. And I only use three questions. I say on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend this session to a colleague? Okay. So, of course, I use the net, net, net promoter, promoter score. Net promoter score, very high. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm a huge fan of that. And I've taught that also because we've used it in our business just to get feedback and punch list from our customers to understand what are the issues if we can't get a nine or a 10. So I do the same for my team. I asked them, how likely do you recommend it? My second question is, what did you find most useful? And my third question is, what would you like to see the next time this is presented or this topic is presented? Mm -hmm. So what I do is I train, I send out that survey, I evaluate the results, make adjustments that make sense, and then I repeat it. Any other favorite sales failures of yours? Something which was a very valuable lesson. One thing I watch people do. Yeah. They mentioned when they would go out to raise money or explain their company, they would over and over again mention my company because we were the biggest. And But they would say, we're better than Canopy at blah, blah, blah. But you know what they did? They just advertised Canopy. Yeah. So now the guy who might have been investing with them calls and says, Bruce, they better at you than blah, blah, blah. Well, I said, those guys, I'm not going to tell you the name. I know who you mean. They're pretty good at it. But there's these two or three things I think that if I were running the place, I might do a little more of that. And then he says, oh, shit, I was thinking about investing. I'm like, when are you doing your next round? Maybe I'll invest with you instead. So what do they do? They just screw themselves by talking about the competitor. Never say one else's name in your sales process unless you're forced to. Absolutely. 
Right now at SNAP, we're evaluating several programs that were going to help us really get our training modules and all of the things that we want them to have at their fingertips. We're looking at mobile. We're looking at gamification for that just-in-time training. Let's say I have a a rep that's going to go see a customer, and we have thousands and thousands of products, our own that we distribute or that we manufacture, as well as many, many partners around the world with Mm -hmm. amazing products. And so they can't memorize everything about those. But what if my team could just open up the app on their mobile device and take a look at a video really quickly and then walk in and be able to really help a customer around a particular topic? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're seeing. So just to summarize, so mobilize, right? So like everybody wants to have this information available right away. Yes. And then you mentioned gamification. So could you tell me about that? Yes. And I think it's pretty common knowledge that most people love to play games of some sort on their phone, whether it's a Sudoku or a crossword puzzle, or a lot of people play Candy Crush. I've never played that, but I hear it's a lot of fun. (laughs) (laughs) So I have a word game that I play on my phone, and I'm at like at level 700 because I love... Thank you. I love word searches and I love to learn. So if there are words that come up, I don't recognize, I always look them up. But because we are a society that are pretty much mobile dependent and some would say addicted <laughs> to our phones, when we're waiting in line or when we're doing something, a lot of people will just take out their phone and or their iPad and play a game. What if we could take that same type of activity and turn it into a learning activity? Let the reps and the team earn rewards every time they pass different certifications or learn and listen to a new course. Mm -hmm. So when they earn badges and they earn points, it lets them compete with each other. It lets them see their accomplishments. And it just makes for a lot more of a fun experience in learning versus, oh, I've got to sit through another in-person training that's taken up my time. This lets them do it on their time. The decade from the early 2000s to 2010 was a constant fight for most entrepreneurs to stay alive. Then in 2007, the dawn of a new era of online advertising started when Mark Zuckerberg introduced his new Facebook ads platform. Just as Google did when they first opened up their platform, Facebook made it easy and affordable for entrepreneurs to buy ads. The costs were low and arbitrage was simple. Facebook's goal was adoption, to get as many people as possible and as fast as possible to use their ad service. And that's exactly what happened. For people like me, it was like the good old days of Google where I could spend 25 cents in ads and make 2 to $3 back for each click. Many of the entrepreneurs who I'm now coached started their companies around this time and have leveraged Facebook to grow their companies quickly. But for the marketers who have been around long enough to remember the earlier bloodbaths that Google and other platforms have put us through, the pattern of Facebook has almost identically matched what Google did when it started. Step number one, the adoption. Make the barrier of entry easy to get everyone in and using the platform. Step number two, the price hike. Slowly raise the prices to squeeze out the margins, killing off any entrepreneur who doesn't understand how to use funnels. And step number three, the slap. Kill off the 50% of advertisers who cause 90% of their headaches. If you spend less than $1 million per month on ads, you're considered a small advertiser. You only make up a tiny percentage of their revenue, yet you're 100 times harder to support than a big brand who cares a lot less about ROI and more about just seeing their brand everywhere. That day after the movie, Payne Jr. and I joke that instead of a Google slap, we're going to see a Zuckerberg Thanos, we've now nicknamed him Zanos, snap, where 50% of all entrepreneurs' businesses would disappear overnight. If you rely 100% on Facebook for your traffic, then this is your warning that a storm is coming. You should implement everything you read in this book so that you can protect your company and thrive during that storm. On the other hand, if the Zeno snap has already happened and you woke up one morning to a dead or quickly dying business, then this book is your answer on how to save your company and get it to thrive again. Well, what we've done is we, of course, have our onboarding program, which is the first four weeks of any sales rep's life at Snap AV. And then we have a series that is every Monday at one o'clock for 90 minutes, and we bring on new products, and that's our continuing education series. And for those that can't attend, we record the session. We also upload that to our team's site, which is our learning library portal right now. We update the recording and the slides together so that anybody that missed it 
can catch up on it. So we have uh, different avenues of learning so that it's not the same for everyone. We know for a fact everyone can't jump on. So we use different platforms and techniques for that blended approach so that everyone gets the information but gets it in the way that they can absorb it. That's right. Why and how do you pick your industries? How do you pick your adventures? It's a good question. So I would say that the number one thing I try to figure out and I'm learning more and more is look for some macro level trade, macro change, big public policy change. So why was technology data communications interesting when I first graduated university in the 90s? It was interesting because America was no longer having monopoly local telephone companies. The whole world was opening up for data communications and big guys who were the incumbents for 100 years had to compete now with all these small guys for data. That means there's a very dynamic event. The reason I did the World Bank stuff in the water was I watched as people were moving. It took, you know, if you look at Canada, it took us a couple hundred years maybe before the majority of the people were living in cities. It used to be more agricultural, rural, and then small towns, and now majority of the people live in big cities. But if you look at a place like India, China, wherever, it's happening overnight. And so that means there's a big pressure to create infrastructure rapidly, so there should be a big opportunity. With cannabis, I wasn't here because of a rational comprehension of the potential of the plant. I was here because public policy was evident to gather in this in a way that was no longer ignoring it. And so I just went, you should do that. That <laughs> That's pretty funny because each time I didn't pick the industries, they picked me. <laughs> So tell, I wasn't tell me about I wasn't that. thinking of of changing industries but exciting things were presented to me at the right time so either a recruiter or a personal reference reached out to me and just the timing was right so each time I was able to use the experience in like the telecom industry or the advertising and publishing industry from Bell South and AT&T moving into the loyalty space with Cartera and be able to use the same approach with the new industry and incorporating new elements. And same thing when I went to NCR, which was technology, mm -hmm. and now for Snap just as well. So this is the fourth time I've changed industries, and I love it. I thrive. I love to learn. So I thrive on learning new things and simplifying them for our teams. Mm -hmm. In the early 20th century, Robert Collier published one of the great books on copywriting, the Robert Collier Letter Book. In this book, he shares how to really understand your customers. If you're going to find them, persuade them to follow you, and hopefully change their lives with the products and the services you sell, you need to know and understand them better than they understand themselves. Collier believed that we as marketers should not be trying to figure out how to create the next amazing ad campaign, but instead we need to learn how to enter the conversations already taking place in the customers' minds. If you want to really understand who your dream customers are and where they are congregating online, you need to be able to enter the conversation that's already taking place inside of their mind and see the world the way that they see it. When you can truly understand the core pains they are trying to move away from and the core desires and passions they are trying to move towards, it becomes really easy to identify exactly where they exist online. As soon as you know where they are online, then you can hook them and bring them into your funnels where you can serve them. We will go into greater detail on how to do that throughout the rest of this book. Now that we have the foundation covered, let's dive into identifying your dream customers with the three core markets, sometimes known as the three core desires. The three core markets slash desires. In Expert Seekers, I introduced the concept of the three core markets or the three core desires. The three desires in no particular order are health, wealth, and relationships. When people purchase any product from anyone, they're hoping to get a certain result in one of those three areas of their lives. So the first question you need to answer is this. Which of these three desires is my future dream customer trying to receive when they buy my product or service? This is the very first layer to getting inside the minds of your dream customer. And for most people, the answer is pretty simple. However, sometimes people get stuck in this question for one of two reasons. Reason number one, my product fits into more than one of these desires. Many products can be marketed towards getting a result in more than one of these desires, but your marketing message can only focus on one of them. Anytime you try to get your potential customer to believe in two things, your conversions will usually cut in half, most times by 90% or more. To target two different desires, you need two different ads leading to two different funnels. Only focus on one desire with each message you put into the market. Reason number two, my product doesn't fit into any of the desires. This false belief was best resolved at one of our recent events where someone told one of my head coaches, Steve J. Larson, this exact same thing. Steve responded by telling the story of Gillette razors and asking which desire a razor fulfilled. At first, everyone was quiet, and then a few people started guessing. Uh, health, another mumbled, or maybe... Um, Steve then played one of the Gillette ads. 
In it, you see how the story develops. First, a man is shown shaving. After the shave, a beautiful woman gets closer to him. And then the two go out for the night on the town. Finally, the ad shows the two together back at home in their room. After showing the ad, Steve asks the question again a little differently. What desire was this marketing message created for? Instantly, everyone responded, relationships. Most products can fit into multiple categories, even if they may look like they don't fit into any category at all. But no matter what, the key is that your marketing message can and must be focused on only one of the three core desires. I want you to take a few minutes and decide which of the three core markets or desires your product or service currently fits into. People overlook the value and impact of public policy. Public policy governs everything, right? If they said the internet is governed and closed tomorrow, does that have a big effect? Yeah. If uh, America said tomorrow we're going to have federal marijuana policy that makes it legal, big event? Yeah. If all of the countries that were the primary contributors of greenhouse gases came to a conclusion tomorrow and said, we have a regulatory framework for greenhouse gas emissions management and how we're going to actually have dollars to transform emitters to non-emitters. Big effect? Yeah, huge. And so I think you should never look past major public policy milestones. What type of stories excite your customers and your partners? Like, What do you see? That is such a great question. I started back with Snap AV in February of this year. And since starting, I've been out in the field with each of our outside sales team members in their different regions visiting customers. And we have, it was just so much fun to be able to sit at the table and see what's important to these dealers and talk to them and see how when our reps would explain and tell them stories around how other installers have been successful with our products and our solutions and also how other installers have resolved actual installation issues just to see how much they gained from that and how it really was able to help them as they thought about what solutions and products they needed. And just one example was I was able to visit the Triad Speaker factory in Portland, Oregon a few months ago. And this is where they custom make speakers. And it was an incredible experience to see that and understand Like even one small part of the customization is where it's if it's a behind wall speaker, Mm -hmm. they can actually cut the speaker case, the casing on it to go around a pipe that may be around a wall, inside a wall. And you can still hear the sound? And the sound is perfect because they know how to make that cabinet for the speaker in a way that will keep the integrity of the sound intact, but at the same time, be able to customize even down to cutting around a tube or a pipe that's in the Mm. back of the inside that wall. And so when I tell that story, they're like, oh, that's really cool. And then I'm able to share with them how I went to the factory and the incredible benefits of having these custom made speakers. So just being able to tell that story is really exciting. Remember, when you're raising capital, you are actually giving people a story of what you're going to do with their money if they give it to you and why it's going to be worth more. Now, it's a story because it hasn't happened. They haven't given you the money and you haven't done the work. So don't claim to have done the work. Don't claim more than you've done. To really understand how to use the conversations that are going on inside the minds of your dream customers, we need to go back in time a few hundred years ago before the internet, before TV, and before radio to where traffic began. Until the early 1800s, people mainly obtained products based on what they needed. They would be in some type of pain and they would go search for a solution to solve it. It started with food. Our ancestors had a desire for health food. So they would search for food, kill it, and bring it home. In more modern times, we have stores. When you need food or something else in your home, you'd go to the local store, search for what you need, and buy it. In 1886, the Yellow Pages directory was created, and it was awesome for consumers because you could find exactly what you needed, and business owners had the luxury of people simply showing up, looking for what they had to sell. It seemed like the perfect solution, except for one thing. As a business owner, if you wanted to make more money or grow your company, you were not in control. You had to wait for people to have a need in order for them to come and to find you. But then, in 1927, the television was invented. And just 15 short years later, on July 1st, 1942, during the Brooklyn Dodgers-Philadelphia Phillies game in Ebbets Field, the first ever TV commercial aired. At the time, there were over 4,000 televisions in New York. And on that day, while families gathered around to watch the big game on NBC, it was interrupted by the first ever TV commercial. That ad, which was just nine seconds long and cost only $9, featured a map of America with a Bulva watch clock face in the middle. At the end of the ad, a voice announced, America runs on Bulva time. And with those nine seconds, the shift from search advertising to interruption advertising had officially begun. People watching TV that night were not searching for a new watch, 
But as they saw the commercial and the pictures of the watch, it placed a seed of desire in their hearts and their minds. They didn't need this watch, but they wanted it. This TV commercial gave business owners a window where they could grab their potential customers' attention long enough to plant a seed of desire and show the perceived value of what they were selling. No longer would people only buy when they needed something. Now advertisers had the ability to create desire and sell people stuff that they wanted. This interruption advertising started happening in other types of media such as radio, newspapers, and direct mail. The process was simple. Get a captive audience, entertain or educate them, and then, when they have their full attention, interrupt them with your message. You can then grab their attention and create a desire for the product or service that you are selling. Nowadays, this type of interruption advertising happens every day around you, but I'm guessing you didn't realize how profound of an impact those advertisements actually made on your buying decisions. How does sales leadership keep up with technology to enable their sales teams? And that's a question we ask ourselves, and we're constantly looking for the best products. There are certain areas that apply to every sales team, which is like territory assignment. How do we divide up the territory? And how do reps map out that territory Mm -hmm. in their routing? So those are really key features that are important in any solution that our team is looking at. That way, they can not only see their customers along the route, they can pop in if somebody has has it made an appointment just to say hello if it's on the way, even down to finding where the hotel stop and start point is and routing it around that. So those are a few as well as a learning platform. We're actually looking for a really great learning platform that integrates with our other programs that we already use, such as Salesforce. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a challenge. How do we keep up? It's ever changing. And how are we delivering and offering these solutions to our team and keeping it current as well as making sure we're staying within our budget and making good choices. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a difference between being a really good business manager and being a good business leader. And so a lot of times we're now saying our best leaders went to Harvard, studied four degrees, and that's probably good. I'm not saying that's bad, but leading is different than managing. Managing is a lot of analysis and and org charts and stuff. A lot of times leading is there isn't information. I got to have a bunch of people follow me. I got to be thoughtful. I got to have reputation of uh, being transparent, you know, a lot of the stuff that isn't easy for people. And so I think the key is to think about like, how is it that what I'm doing as a leader, not as an employee, not as like uh, anything else, but as a leader, how am I actually getting people to want to follow me? The pros for search-based traffic is that when they come to you, they're hot buyers who are ready to buy. This is similar to people who walk into your store or find you in the yellow pages and give you a call. The con with search-based traffic is that they're not just searching, they're also comparing options with your competitors. you got to be the price leader as well as the quality leader and the niche leader. People who are searching are also researching all of those things. So until you become good at funnels and offers, you're likely to be trying to beat your competitors by lowering your prices. Unfortunately, trying to be the cheapest product is never a good strategy. What does the art of storytelling mean to you, professionally and personally? Oh, goodness. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this. I have a journalism degree. My undergrad is in journalism. Wow. So, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, it is. Communication is a passion for me, as storytelling is what connects us as humans. It's also the earliest form of communication. And to me, words have so much power. They have the power and the ability to change our hearts, to change our world, to change our companies, our mindset. So, storytelling in that connection that you make with people is what develops relationships. So storytelling is really huge. As a marketer, you can target people who are interested in certain people, ideas, TV shows, or bands, and then you can interrupt them with your ads. You open a small window of time where you can grab their attention and show them the perceived value of what you're selling. You no longer have to wait around for someone to come looking for you. You can now create desire in your dream customers. The pros for social-based interruption traffic is you can target warm traffic based on people's interests. Therefore, you can sell based on the perceived value of your product or service. The con for social-based interruption traffic is that because the customer isn't actively looking for you, you have to become good at your hook, story, offer, where you can grab their attention, tell them a story, and then make them an offer. We'll be covering how to do this in more detail in secret number three. Now that you've identified who your dream customer avatar is, what their core desires are, and if they're moving away from pain or towards pleasure, the next question we ask is, where are they congregating? As you will learn in the next chapter, there are congregations where the scrollers are hanging out and congregations you can target for the searcher. That does it for this episode of Storytelling for Sales. You'll find show notes and links on our webpage, storytellingsales.com. 
You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.